Now, when, I, when this lecture was scheduled about six months ago, I thought it would be just be the internal audience, you know, but so but now all of a sudden I found out last evening that we'll have these distinguished set of individuals in the audience, so I had to sort of stay up till late in the night to change my talk, you know. <laughs> but hopefully um, some of you who are very knowledgeable in biometrics, I don't have to, um, uh, I'm not repeating everything which you know. So uh, there's a huge interest in biometrics. It is not a new topic. It's been around for 100 years. Fingerprints have been used for 100 years. So why is it suddenly everybody's talking about biometrics? And, and it's, it's here to stay. And I think that's what I want to, to convey to you and tell you that this is an important problem. All of us will be authenticated using our body characteristics <laughs> sometime or the other if you not already have been fingerprinted, for example. Most of you probably in the audience have been fingerprinted. Um, you know, so I think, I think it's, it's very important that we understand this technology and what are its, why it is so popular and what are its potential disadvantages as well. So this is sort of the outline, what is biometrics? Why do we use biometric recognition? Um, what does it consist of? How do we design an automatic biometrics system? And what are some of the challenges? And since this talk is in conjunction with the IARPA uh, program, Janus, I think it fits in because some of the challenges which I will mention are covered under the IARPA Janus program. So every organization every day has to address these questions. Does the applicant have a prior criminal record? You know, and that's one of the reasons why most of us in this room have been fingerprinted. Who accessed the bank vault, some kind of an audit trail? Is the credit card holder the rightful owner? We all know about the credit card fraud. Does the passport applicant already have a passport? This is called the deduplication process. And passport can be replaced by driver license or any other government issued ID. So typically what we do uh, when, we, when, we are, when we ask these questions, the way we address is based on what are called credentials. And credentials are some, what are surrogate representations of identity, something which is, which is given to you. And what, what is that? What, what you know, which is passwords and PIN, and what you have, something, some documents which you carry, which are driver license, passport, here, for example, Noblis ID card, which lets you in inside the building. And you know, that hasn't changed for years. I mean, Noblis is still using the same method, show your ID card to the desk person, you know, put it near the card reader and, and you let in. That, that, that technology hasn't changed very much. So what are some of the problems we have? These are well-known problems, right? I mean, we have too many passwords to remember because for every account which we have, good security practice tells you you should have a different password. You know, and something which is not easy to crack. So if you, if you go sometime to the government website, it is a nuisance because they check the strength of the password which you are using, and they will ask you, it must have some capital letter, it must have some digits, it must be eight characters long, and it must have a special character. Do you, will you ever remember that after you are done once? You don't, so what do you do? You either write it down, or then you go on to the system again and go through this process again. In fact, in a large organization, most of the help desk calls uh, are related to password reset. So what do we do instead of having a complicated password which the good security practice uh, dictates? We keep it very simple. And so it's not a surprise that the most popular password is one, two, three, four, five, six, and, and so on. You know, so in fact, you think that the password protection is a very strong method of authentication, it is not. Just, you don't have to go through all possible combinations of the passwords to crack it. You don't have to do brute force. If I try some of these common ones, I can crack some of the password protected accounts. And once you get into the system, that's where the imposter can create havoc, you know. And that's how most of the cyber crimes are committed. You don't have to break everybody's account. As long as you can break one account, you are into the system. What about the, the other form of credential, namely the driver license? So this, this picture was just sent to me 
two days ago by, by the Michigan State Police. And they have started doing scrubbing their driver license database now. So in the state of Michigan, they have 13.5 million <coughs> records in the Michigan Department of Motor Vehicle. And now they are checking using for the first time whether a record has multiple individuals enrolled in the system. Okay, so these are two examples, one male in the top, who when they did the data scrubbing, they found another person's picture in the database. And at the bottom, there are two, four, five. There are five images in the record. And this person who's, who's being searched, there are two faces of a different person, okay? And this problem is known to exist in every DMV and as well as in passport databases. But why don't we do anything about it? Well, it's basically the question of cost. The technology is there, but it's the question of the cost. What about the passports? So Interpol, most of you know who the Interpol is. It's, a, it's an international law enforcement agency. It maintains a database of 40 million lost or stolen travel documents. And these travel documents mean visa, passports, and so on. And what happens when the passport is stolen? Now you have a, a valid government-issued document. It's not a forged document, which can be easily manipulated. And so in Spanish police arrested seven men connected to Al-Qaeda, whose task was to steal 40 passports per month. And there are many such instances. And and most of the time at border crossing, the passports are scrutinized by, by the immigration officer. And there have been some statistics that they cannot differentiate between the person's true face and the picture in the, in the, in the passport. What about credit cards? I think I'm sure all of you are following that the breaches in the credit card accounts have been growing every year. Right? So this is one of the largest credit card breach. <coughs> JP Morgan says data belonging to 83 million customers was stolen. <coughs> and what happens when the data is stolen? 88% of stolen data used within minutes. That is, so it's not that the, you know, the data is just stolen and lying someplace, as the credit card agencies might lead you to believe. And in fact, there is a statistics which shows that the transaction involving the stolen data is higher, the amount of transaction is higher than when the true owner of the credit card does the transaction. So the counterfeit credit, credit card fraud in the United States amounted to $5.3 billion in 2012. Now why doesn't the credit card agencies do anything about it? Well, the reason is the cost of changing all the processing at the point of sale terminals will cost them more than $5.2 billion. And this is a very, very small amount compared to trillions of dollars of transactions they do. So they just view it as a cost of doing transaction. What about bank ATM? Same thing. We do two-factor authentication. Every time you want to withdraw the money, you enter the card and a four-digit PIN. Most common four-digit PIN people use is one, two, three, four, right? In fact, if you have a complicated PIN, Often people write the PIN number on the card itself. So if you lose the card, then the second factor is gone. And again, the total estimated annual number of unauthorized transactions, third party fraud in 2012, was 31 million with a value of 6 billion. This was uh, released recently from the Federal Reserve uh, Bank. So as a result now, how do we increase the security? And so this is an example of a biometrics ATM in China. It's a three-factor authentication, card, pin, and some kind of body characteristics, in this case, finger vein. Okay, why didn't they use fingerprint? Well, we can talk about this later, but sometimes, you know, in, in some countries, fingerprints are associated with criminals, and they tend to avoid using a modality, they tend to use modality which is different. Especially in Asian countries, in Japan, the palm vein system is extremely popular, the touchless palm vein, so you're not touching any surface. So there's systems like this in Brazil, systems like this in India. So these 
biometric enabled ATM machines are popping up. So what is the origin of the term biometrics? Where did it get started? I mean, quite often when we talk about biometrics, <coughs> there is a journal called Biometrica, which is sort of deals with, you know, which is popular among st statisticians for doing data analysis. But the word biometrics actually comes from two Greek words. Bios means life, and metron means a measure. It's a, some, some kind of a measurement on the human body. And the first use of biometrics for recognition purposes, as it is practiced these days, was introduced by Pollock in 1981 in a New York Times uh, article. And so he, he posed the question, what makes each person unique? And that's really what we are trying to address, whether we are doing face recognition, fingerprint recognition, or any other kind of biometric recognition. So what do we do in biometrics? Our hope is that we take the human body, okay, and we generate a unique key out of it somehow. That's the ultimate goal. So the recognition is now based on the body, inherent characteristics of the human body, rather than some external source of information which is linked to that body. Okay, this way you don't have to carry any card, you don't have to carry any, you don't have to remember any passwords, you just present yourself and the system knows who you are. So what are the popular bio biometric traits which are being used? There are a lot more than what I have sh shown you here, but I think the first three, the top three, are the most popular biometric traits. I would say more than 95% or not even 99% of the system, biometric systems available in the market are based either on fingerprint, face, or iris. And fingerprint and face will never be replaced by any other trait because there's a huge legacy database of fingerprints and face in every government database. Iris is building up, but we still, for example, US government does not have any large iris, iris database of a large number of individuals. And then there are some other systems, the palm vein, touchless palm vein system made by Fujitsu, the palm print is getting more traction now because the computing power has increased. But palm print recognition does not offer any advantage over fingerprint except at the crime scenes. So the latent palm print is getting more traction, but full palm print to full palm print uh, is not of that value. Some of, one of the earliest method used was the shape of the hand. You know, there's a system made by IdentiMate in 1970, and it is still being used in time and attendance applications in, in factories. There's a voice print, scar marks and tattoos, which we can call as soft biometrics because that can, you can erase your tattoo. Um, there's a finger vein, signature, but I would primarily focus on the first three, and since I, I do most of my work in fingerprint and face, most of my examples will be related to that. So now the question is, can, can we use any part of the human body as a biometric trait? Well, I think you know, before you jump into saying, well, I will use the length of my right toe as a biometric trait, you need to sort of address some questions. Is it unique among the population of interest? Is it permanent over time? Universality, everybody in the population of interest should have it. How easy it is to measure it? Performance, both in terms of error rate as well as throughput, how many people you can process uh, per second or per minute. User experience, circumvention, and integration in a system. After all, biometric by itself is of no value. It has to be integrated into some security system or authentication system. So based on that, we can reject some of the biometric traits which have been proposed in the academic uh, literature, and I think uh, most people who work in biometrics don't pay attention uh, to these requirements. They're more interested in presenting a new biometric rather than addressing some of these questions. So now the question is which trait to use, even though I said that fingerprint, face, and iris are the most popular. But that doesn't mean that we should be only restricting ourselves to those three biometrics. There are many examples where other biometrics may be, may be useful. So for, 
for whatever reason, the touchless palm vein system, system has found a lot of traction in healthcare for, for avoiding insurance fraud, for preventing medical errors, um, for uh, you know, uh, reducing duplicate records. So the Texas Health System has uh, adopted touchless biometric system, touchless palm vein biometric system. And when I was talking to the, uh, the Michigan hospital systems, they're also leaning towards that. And I think one of the reasons is, as I mentioned, that the fingerprints are typically associated with criminality. Also, this is a touchless system which has some advantages as opposed to touching a surface where patients are coming there. On the right, I'm showing you an example which is quite interesting. As you know, in China, there are a large number of coal mines and there, there have been a lot of coal mine accidents in China. So they want to keep track of who went inside the mine and who came out and how do we keep track of that. And so as you can see, in this particular case, face recognition will be problematic. Fingerprint recognition will be, will be is not advisable. And so they're using iris recognition uh, system here. So as I mentioned, biometrics is not new. Some of the early pioneers in fingerprint recognition, particularly Francis Galton, this is the paper he published in Nature in 1888. And it is, he's, he's basically pointing out, isn't it amazing that just a small portion of our skin on the finger can be used to identify ourselves? Just think about it. You know, with this whole body, there's no other such a small portion of the human body which can be used to uniquely identify fingerprints. In principle, there are seven billion people living in this world. And so there are seven billion right index finger. And the, the hypothesis is that all the seven fingerprints on all these seven billion index fingers, right index fingers, are different. Okay. And just to make sure, suppose it is not true. We don't know the answer for that. Suppose it is not true. Let's take all 10 fingerprints and fuse them together. And that's why law enforcement agencies use 10 fingerprints rather than one fingerprint, because they can afford to. You know, you know the, when they arrest somebody, he doesn't have much choice but to follow, <laughs> listen to it. But for the Apple iPhone, they're not, you're not going to wait for giving 10 fingerprints. So one fingerprint is quite popular in civil applications, but 10 fingerprints in in forensics. So, so this, the skin on the human body, on the, on the palms and on the bottom of our feet are different compared to the skin on the other part of our body. And basically it is characterized in terms of ridges and valleys and it is referred to as friction ridge patterns. And the reason why we call it friction-rich patterns is because supposedly these ridges and valleys allow us to grasp objects, right? I mean, it was, it was not meant, I don't know how the, what the origin came about, it was not meant to be a method for recognition, right? But nevertheless, um, it is the friction-rich pattern. And that's why it's referred to as dermatoglyphics, you know, Glyphics is sort of designed carving and derma is the skin. So basically fingerprints are essentially carving on the, on the skin. So in the hospitals, for example, in the United States for the newborns, you know, they often take the footprint of the babies. They never do the matching, but just take it just in case there is a doubt that, uh, you know, the child was swapped or... And actually that's becoming a problem now in many countries, for example, in Brazil, where the baby stealing or swapping from the hospital is, is, um, is, is, is reasonably common. This is a, this, how do we identify children is becoming a major problem. So in the early days of fingerprints, people were always curious about this friction rich pattern on their fingers. But they didn't know that it's a unique identifier. So many artists, when they made an artifact, they put their impression on the, on the object they made. 
And in countries like China and even in India, even to this date, where the large number of people who are illiterate cannot sign their name, thumbprint is a legal, is a signature on the legal documents. There's no matching done, but it's just sort of a proof that this, this document was signed by this individual. So <clears throat> after this discovery that fingerprints can be useful for identification, the law enforcement agencies started collecting the database. And the first database which was created was by Scotland Yard in 1905, almost 100 years ago. And then FBI followed in 1924, formed a fingerprint bureau. But the first automatic fingerprint identification system, APHIS, didn't come around till 1980. The algorithm was published in an article in Nature in about mid-1970s, but the fully operational system didn't come about till 1980. And currently, the database has approximately 75 million criminals, so there are 700 million fingerprints and 34 million civilians. And what is, what is fingerprints being used for? So there's something called 10 prints, which I'm assuming most of you, including myself, have provided. You know, somebody ro holds your finger and rolls it. All 10 prints are covered. That's the first two rows on the left card. And then there are slap fingerprints, four, four, and the two, two thumb prints. Okay. And this is basically what goes on at the border crossing in the US. Any visitor coming from non-visa waiver country provides the 10 slap prints because roll prints require somebody to hold your finger and, and provide the fingerprint. So that's primarily, the 10 print matching is primarily done to do the background check or find if this criminal is already in the database under an alias. But it's the latent matching which is what is used by forensics to solve crimes. And that's still a very challenging problem. So at a crime scene, we lift this partial fingerprint which is smudgy, noisy, has a lot of background clutter. How do we match it to the rolled fingerprint database which resides in state agencies or, or the FBI? So just to, many, most of you know about how a biometric system works, but for those who do not, I think I, it's good to point out. So there is an enrollment phase and then there's a verification phase. So let's say your bank suddenly decides that if, before you withdraw the money, you must pro we must use a biometric. Let's say they decide to use fingerprints. So all you have to do is go to the bank, provide your fingerprint, and they will link to your account number. Okay? At the time of the withdrawal, the same process. You provide your fingerprint, and now it will match to your fingerprint in the database. So this is verification because you're claiming who you are because you inserted the card, so it's a one-to-one -one matching. Okay. And what is the output of this matcher or comparator? It's a similarity score. This is unlike the PIN number or the password. You know, in the PIN number or the password, the output is zero or one, right? There's nothing like that all oh, out of eight, eight, digit, eight character passwords, seven are correct, so it's a 90% match, right? That's not, that doesn't happen. So this poses a problem because now we have to put a threshold on the similarity score and decide when to call it a successful match and when to reject this match. So we need to have a, this threshold T, which plays a very important role. And the reason it plays a very important role is you can raise this threshold or lower this threshold. If you raise this threshold, you know, now you're requiring that the person present a fingerprint print which is very pristine and in the same condition when it was enrolled. So whether it's fingerprint or face or iris, the same idea works, okay? Now, if you have a high security system, you can raise the threshold. It's the same matching algorithm, but you can raise the threshold. It's like the threat level which DHS has, right? I mean, if there's a high thre threat level, they'll, they'll check more passengers, otherwise they'll be, they'll be relaxed. And then identification is one-to-end matching, which is a more difficult problem. Because now somebody applies for a passport and you want to know whether this guy already has a passport under a different name. So now we have to take that face image 
and the State Department has to match it. It's, I don't know, 50 million face database of all the individuals who have been issued a passport, right? So that's a more challenging problem than one-to-one -one verification. So let me just show you how it works for fingerprints. You know, I know some of you are experts in the fingerprint in the audience. So there are two types of features in a fingerprint. One is the friction-rich type. How, what is the flow of the ridge pattern, ridges and valleys in the fingerprint? And so generally, at the broad level, there are three types of fingerprint. If you look at your fingerprint closely, you can tell whether it's an arch type, a loop type, or whorl type. And the loops are left loop and the right loop. Left loop, the ridges enter from the left and exit from the right. Okay? And you can do a classification based on the presence of these points of singularity called core and delta, where the, where the orientation flow changes abruptly. So this is at the high level, one could use it for sort of filtering the database. But at the fine level, when you actually do the comparison, you use what are called ridge endings and ridge bifurcations, where the ridges abruptly end and ridges bifurcate. And typically, there are about 100 such points in a rolled fingerprint image. In a slab, there might be fewer. And in an Apple iPhone, where they have a fingerprint sensor, there may not be any minutia because the size of that image is only 70 by 70, and the roll fingerprint is 512 by 512. So how do we do the comparison? We have a query fingerprint. We have a reference fingerprint. We basically find the minutia in both of them. I'm giving you a simplified version of it, but almost every commercial fingerprint matcher relies on, on minutia, except the iPhone. And then you find the similarity based on how many correspondences you could establish. And then based on the threshold you set, you decide whether it's a match or a non-match. Now, unlike what, some what you may have read or what some people may have made you believe, biometric systems are not perfect. They make errors. And the errors depend on how the, what is the quality of the image which was acquired. It also depends on the threshold you set so the two types of error, errors, if you're doing a one-to-one -one comparison, false match, false reject, right? Your fingerprint was matched to somebody else's, or it's really you, but the system didn't recognize you based on the fingerprint, right? Be why? Because, you know, finger may be wet, you know, you may have dirt on your finger, you may have a large cut on the finger. So in that sense, biometric systems make errors. So let's say your, your local bank has a fingerprint verification system for withdrawing the money at the ATM, and you go in the night, and you really need the money, and the system doesn't recognize you. What are you going to do? So there always has to be some, some sort of a bypass mechanism in order not to upset the customers. Right? So in order to talk about the errors, we have to talk about two types of distribution. So Vertical axis is frequency, horizontal axis is similarity. So the blue curve shows what is called imposter scores. When I match my fingerprint to everybody else in this room, that score will be low. And so typically, imposter distribution is peaked and to the left. And the red curve is when I match multiple acquisitions of my finger under different conditions, on different days, at different times, and that's generally flat. Okay, it's generally on the right side, but there is an overlap. And the error occurs because these two distributions overlap. If you can avoid the overlap, no errors. Okay. So the role of the threshold is to decide if the score is below T, we say it's not the same person. The two impressions do not come from the same person. Otherwise, it's a match. So these are the types of errors. Systems are quite robust, but they still make errors. So here the score is 0 0.39. It's a true except the two impressions come from the same finger. This is a false reject. And the reason for that is because of the large cut and maybe only part of the fingerprint was captured at the, at the verification time. Here is an example of true reject. And you can, it's easy to see it's a true reject because the, the fingerprint type is different. And here is a false accept. Uh, they look quite similar, same type, and probably one, uh, you know, due to distortion, 
they turned out to be a relatively high score. Now, in the case of fingerprint, it's, it's quite easy because the same features which were proposed 100 years ago, we still use them. Okay? In that respect, face recognition is more challenging because we don't know what features to use. Everybody's using their own proprietary features. They use, you know, we started out in 1980s with global features like eigenfaces, right? And there was a big excitement for five to 10 years, but it had nothing to do with the face, rec face characteristics. Eigenfaces, you can compute eigen image of anything, any object, okay? But there was a lot of excitement for the five or 10 years because people applied on a very small database, controlled elimination, but as things started getting more challenging, people had to abandon that. So there was Eigen phase, Fisher phase. Then people said, well, we need to look at local characteristics in the face. So that seems to be a little bit more popular. Or look at 3D models of the face. So that's what this Janus program is all about. So the problem in face recognition is you have a query image called probe. You have a large database of gallery. And you need to find the match. But the challenge is what features to use and which similarity measure to use. Because you can decide on the features, but you still then have to decide how to compute the distance between two feature vectors. So now, so this, all this history about forensics, which we have been using for 100 years with great success. So if you have rolled impressions, if you have mug shots, things work quite well. Okay? But now, we are finding that biometrics has other applications besides just catching criminals. And so this happened because of two, first of all, two things. Progress in sensor technology. So when I first started working in fingerprints in 1992, the first sensor I bought was this Identix sensor, which was size of a brick. <laughs> and it costed me $1,500 in 1995, which was a lot of money at that time. And then we have moved now, so the, it was still an optical scanner in 1995, but now we have smaller optical sensors, which cost, you know, the whole fixed scanner and SDK cost $50 or so. We have a multi-spectral fingerprint sensor. This is what is used in the Disney park uh, in Orlando and other parks. Then we have the swipe sensor, authentic, which four years ago was bought by Apple. That, that gave an indication that Apple is going to come up with some product. Then we have this morpho finger on the fly. So now all the four, finger, four fingers can be captured in just moving the hand in front of the sensor. And finally, we have this small <coughs> capacitive sensor which is embedded in the mobile phone. In this particular case, from this company, it's 96 by 96 pixels, but the Apple sensor is even smaller, 70 by 70. Okay, but I'm just showing you an image to indicate that now suddenly the matching has to be done based on something other than minutia, because the number of minutia points in these small images is very few. The other progress which we have made is in processor and storage technology. Now you can read about processor, how much we have 1,000 times faster processor, and the memory cost has dropped by, by four or five orders of magnitude. But I thought this image will illustrate uh, this much better. So in 1989, Michigan, state of Michigan adopted the AFIS. That was the first year they bought it. Okay. And this is how the room looked at that time. The database was 724,000, and, and the comparison spe speed was 15,000 comparisons per second. And this is the 2014 uh, machine. It's an NEC matcher. They have 3.5 enrollment. Um, and the comparison is 25 million comparisons per second. OK. So, so you can see, so this has, this has made tremendous. Uh, of course, the algorithms have also improved. But a lot of the progress in biometrics is because of these sensor technology and the processing technology. So now I just want to give you some examples of game changers, which in my opinion has led to the pervasiveness or the spread of, of biometric technology. So the first one is the, is the US visit 
which is now called OBIM, in, introduced in 2004 after the 2001 terrorist attack. The government had to take some action. And at that time, they said, well, everybody will, will take two fingerprints of everybody. And then sometimes later in 2008 or seven, they said, well, we need to take all 10 to be compatible with the FBI uh, database. The next thing is Walt Disney theme park in 2005. And this had nothing to do with the security. This primarily had to do with many ticket holders for sharing the ticket with somebody else. And Disney was losing money. So this is an example where the threshold can be very low. You don't want to upset the valid customer, even though once in a while the imposters will, will get in. Okay. The next game changer, in my opinion, is the FBI's next generation identification, NGI, because where they say, well, we need to move beyond fingerprint. We need to consider palm print, face, iris. So face is already online. And I think uh, progress is being made on palm print. And they also have an interest in scar marks and tattoos, because in criminal investigation, a lot of individuals can be identified based on scars and tattoos. Especially if you have a surveillance video, the face may not be very clear, but the tattoo or the scar May, may, may help in identifying the suspect. So as I indicated, the first AFIS was in 1980. The IAFIS was launched in 1999. So IAFIS stands for Integrated AFIS. That's where there was an online link between all the state AFIS systems and the FBI's central repository. So if a search is made in the state of Michigan, they didn't find the criminal. It's a high value crime. Then they share it with the, with the FBI online. The next game changer, in my opinion, is the India's Aadhaar program, in started in 2009. And basically, they want to give a unique 12-digit ID number to every resident in India, which is about 1.2 billion and growing. And in order to, again, resolve these identities, they said, well, fingerprint is not enough. Iris is not enough. They said, well, we need to use a fusion of fingerprint and iris. So for every resident who wants this number, they take 10 fingerprints and two iris. They also capture the face, but face is not used for deduplication. So they take the 10 fingerprints, two iris images, and search the database of everyone who has been issued the number to see if this person who is applying for a number in Bombay already then go to some other city and applied for the, for the number. So this is the de deduplication process, which I showed you is what Michigan is trying to do with the driver license based on the face. So now, in, in about five years, they have enrolled 700 million residents in India. This is a massive project. I mean, just imagine India consists of villages, remote areas. So it's not that these people are coming to some central site to get provide their data. Nobody will come. The, peop the registrars have to go there to, to enroll these these subjects. And there are 500 million more to go. Right? So this is the world's largest biometric database. So far, despite all the political upheavals in India, this has survived. And now the applications of authentication are being built on top of it. So this central agency is only responsible for certifying that this 12-digit number is unique for this individual. And India's program is now by followed by many other countries. For example, Brazil uh, has, is considering, but Indonesia has already launched, Mexico has already launched. So over one billion people have been covered by biometric identification programs. The other game changer is the 2013 release of, of uh, iPhone 5S, which has the Touch ID system. And um, you know, about about 60% of the mobile phone users don't, don't protect their phone even with PIN, okay? And if they protect it with PIN, it's one, two, three, four, okay? So, so, and you know, these days, I think we spend more time on mobile phone than our notebook and our laptop or desktop, right? It has a lot more valuable information. And you know, for that matter, a smartphone costs the same or more than a no notebook. So it's important for people to, to do that. And this has been quite successful. There have not been any 
well-known glitches. Another game changer is again by Apple, 2014, and this is the Apple Pay. I think this is really going to change things on how we pay. So it's like cash, credit, or Apple Pay, right? And already more than 100 large banks and department stores have signed up for it. So the idea is all your card information is now stored on the phone itself. So when you, when you make a purchase, you don't have to present a card. The information is already there. You, you make a communication through the through near field communication device, and then you enter your finger on the, place your finger on the fingerprint sensor, and it does the recognition. So it is a two-factor authentication. You have to have the device, and then you have, you're providing the fingerprint. And today's uh, USA Today said, well, with all this success, it won't be a surprise if Apple becomes the first $1 trillion, has a $1 trillion valuation. Now, mobile phones are everywhere. So anything you do with mobile phones will be a big hit. So there are 7 billion people living on the earth. And there are 7 billion mobile phones. You know, and this, this number is growing. So this guy in Africa, he has a mobile phone. He does not have a running water in his house, no toilet, no covered, you know, concrete building which he's living in. This form of communication has really changed. And I think this payment system, secure payment system, will really change lives of many of these people who don't have access to the banks very easily. So I think I'm tr coming to an end. So what is the performance of the biometric system? As I said, I'm just primarily showing the numbers here for face, fingerprint, and iris because, you know, the most credible numbers are from the IRIS study, from the NIST studies, and I think NIST has done a really remarkable job in, in, in advancing the state of the art by periodically conducting these, uh, these studies. So one way to illustrate the state of the art performance is to look at these two axes. Is the user cooperative or uncooperative? And the vertical axis is the imaging conditions, constrained or unconstrained. So the easiest problem is the at near the origin, we have a constrained imagery, and the user is cooperative, listening to the instructions, and that performance is under control. Right? Doesn't mean it's 100% solved. As I said, you know, you'll still have some occasional errors. And then you have the most difficult scenario on the upper right corner. So LFW is one of the popular public domain databases of unconstrained imagery. So it has the best commercial matcher has about 54% true accept rate at 0.1% FAR. Now it's important to notice that the scales are different for FAR. For fingerprint and iris, the FAR is 0.01%, but for face, it is 0.1%. And if you go to the LFW website, they will report 99% TAR at 1% FAR. So it's important to always keep in mind that the scales are, are, are the same. Right? And I think this is where the Janus program is trying to push the state of the art for unconstrained, unconstrained, uncooperative uh, face recognition. NIST SD27, which is the latent fingerprint, the best latent commercial <coughs> matcher, gives about 72% rank one accuracy, and, and so on. So what are some of the challenges? Well, you know, after all these years of biometric, we still don't know the fundamental question. What is the resolving power of a biometric trait? If I give you a 10-digit PIN number, I know how many unique PINs I can assign to individuals, right? But if I ask the question, what can we say about a biometric trait? We don't know, okay? And there's also a difference between trait versus sensed image, and that's where I think the previous slide about imaging condition is extremely important. So, <laughs> you know, the, the number of twins is increasing, and that's why FBI has been collecting the twin database in, of all places, Twinsburg, Ohio. Every year, FBI sends a team to collect the data of the twins. So here's the problem, you know, tattoos are useful to the FBI, but there are other uses of tattoos as well. So this is the issue now of the capacity of a biometric trait. You know, so here the China, China has a population of 1.3 billion. 
can I come, can a state of the art courts recognize these, uh, if I just gave the mug shots? We don't know the answer to this question. The same question, the next question we can ask is the persistence of a biometric trait. Over time, what can we say about the, about the performance of a biometric recognition system? Should we be updating the template periodically? Or the template, once we enrolled, is good for the rest of the life? What about the face recognition accuracy? Fortunately, we have a large database of face images from PCSO, thanks to Scott McCollum, who was at PCSO that time. So here is the same subject arrested multiple times. And below each image, I am showing you the face scores which Brendan computed when he was at Michigan State. The gallery seed and the subsequent record, as you can see, the scores go down. So, can, well, so there's a, there are two issues here. One is we need to boost the face recognition performance to account for aging. And the second is maybe there's a limit to how much time lapse face recognition can tolerate over time. The next challenge is rate, latent to role comparison. As I said, role to role matching is, is essentially under control. But given a, given a latent print with noisy background, how can we match it? So some of the work we are doing, we sort of try to automatically generate a template from it. And when we feed in this template along with the, to a, to a COTS latent matcher, we can boost the performance. So this idea, this notion of using multiple templates rather than relying on a single template to, to do biometric recognition is, is quite useful. I think the workshop which follows this is about the unconstrained face detection and recognition. So I just want to motivate this also. I mean, I already had this slide in my presentation. But one of the challenges is you cannot do the recognition if you cannot, do the, if you cannot detect the face. So while this face detector does fairly good, there are still some faces which you and I can detect in this crowd, but which the state of the art face detector cannot do. <coughs> And finally, I want to just show what, what, uh, what uh, uh, Josh uh, did in my lab when he stayed for six months. Um, you know, he was there in the spring semester of 2013 when the Boston bombing incident took place. <coughs> and um, so there were two suspects, the two brothers. Uh, and uh, on the right side is the, well, the the. There was a mug shot of the older brother, but there's the photo of the younger brother was in, from the social media websites. And um, what, he, what's, what uh, Josh did was to take the one million PCSO mug shots and try to match it. The, the younger brother could be matched at rank one by one of the courts matchers, but the older, older brother didn't make a hit till rank 5,000 or something. So more recently, what we did, uh, uh, Brendan and uh, Scott Klum, who is also at Noblis now, they built a system, and Josh also helped in that, built a system for taking the sketch and matching it to the, to the mugshot. So this is called Face Sketch ID system, which now has been licensed to Morpho. So basically, you can enter a sketch in the system and match it against the, against the mugshot database. So we said, well, let's try to see how we can do this face Click on it. So this is the sort of the video of the uh, of the Boston Marathon bombing. On the right now, we will see the uh, the um, the two images of the older brother. So what we did was we asked a sketch artist to draw a sketch of the face because the you know the eyes were covered with the sunglasses. And the sketch then made a hit. So this sort of shows the power of sketch-based recognition when either you don't have a face image of the suspect or you have a very low quality face image which cannot be matched by the commercial court matcher. So in, in conclusion, what I want to sort of point out is that biometrics as we know currently has its origin in forensics. And now we moved into mobile phone authentication. But I think most of the challenging problems which remain are, we, are back into forensics now. And so, so this uh, 
2009 NRC report, National Research Council report about strengthening forensic science in the United States is suddenly receiving a lot of attention, not only by the, by the law enforcement agencies, NIST, and many other government organizations. And, and the challenge is to find the statistical underpinnings of forensic evidence. And two questions which I posed earlier, what is the capacity of a biometric trait and what is the performance over time, directly address uh, uh, some of the points raised in this, in this report. So if you, if you are presenting forensic evidence, what is the confidence interval and what is the, pro what is the chance that this, this, is a, this could have been matched to somebody else? So this, this I think, sort of illustrates why we need more attention to forensic science rather than other kinds of applications. So this article appeared on September 16th, and it shows one form of forensic evidence, namely the bite mark, and how many individuals have been wrongfully convicted based on the bite marks, and now being exonerated based on the DNA. I mean, if you want to know more about it, you can go visit the Innocence Project website where they list lot of wrongful convictions. So to summarize, fingerprint matching has been successfully used in forensics for over 100 years. Now biometrics is pervasive in our society and is here to stay. And the main reason why it is, it is needed is to enhance security and eliminate fraud, financial fraud, whether it is in the government or your own personal accounts. But there are still a number of challenges, recognition under non-ideal conditions, spoof detection, user privacy, system integrity, and, and, and so forth. So with that, I will stop. And if there are any few questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Anila, you're probably aware that the South Koreans have submitted a working draft or a standard for palm crease um, biometric uh, identification technology to, to insights. Uh, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on the viability of that. I guess they have a lot of fortune time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the, um, you know, the palm, palm print matching has sort of the same general principle as fingerprint matching. I mean, a lot of palm, palm print match. Palm crease, right, right. Well, so I think the only problem I would see is that the, sometimes because of the concavity in the, in the palm, acquisition of the palm print can be a little bit problematic. Uh, the other thing is, why do we need it? Is it is, will it perform better than fingerprints? Probably not. So, so I really don't know what their rationale is to push palm crease. The techniques in the literature basically extract features, specific features, <coughs> by some classifiers. I just want to know your opinion. Is that what we're going to continue, or do you think we should come up with something which is drastically different in order to improve that technology? You mean like deep networks? Well, deep network actually extract features, but it, it is automatic features, uh, followed by classifiers. I, I, maybe that's one of the approach. But I want your opinion. I think the, to answer, answer your question, question, if you know something about the biometric trait and you know some domain information, then the features derived based on the domain knowledge will always do better than, this, than the black box. Okay? So in the case of fingerprint, I don't, people have tried correlation-based methods. Uh, there are other approaches which have been tried. Um, but there is no reason to deviate from, 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 from minutia points uh, unless, you know, as in the case of very small sized image, uh, there are no minutia. But that's not as critical an application as, say, law enforcement. Or It also depends on what application you have in mind um, or whether the computing power needed to extract, say, minutia or in the case of face, some local features is extremely high. Um, in the case of face, we have, we have an issue. We don't exactly know what we should be looking for, but we, we know that the landmarks are useful. But what happens if the landmarks are missing? Only one eye is present, or let's just say no eye is present in the, in the face, but the, only the bottom part of the face is available. 
So I think uh, whatever you know, you can utilize based on some prior knowledge about the imagery that that's likely to work better. Has there been any research into brain waves as a biometric? Yes. So, so the question is, has there been any research in brain waves? Well, I mean, I don't know what you mean by brain waves, but EEG, EEG, yes, EEG, EKG, they've all been tried. But, you know, these studies are sort of academic studies with only a couple of hundred subjects in ideal conditions, you know. So the question is, would you like to be authenticated if you're buying a hamburger by wearing something. Well, I mean, maybe there is some secure installation where you are, uh, you know, you're required to do all these different things, put you under the CAT scan. I think CAT scan was under my rejected uh, biometrics. I think uh, the okay. whole question of post-mortem identification is a little bit more interesting, doesn't it? Yes. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, thank you. A noblest plan in our academic tradition. Uh, I hope you come back again. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much.